Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, this opportunity, institutions and individuals. Um, since this is a, a conference on the matters of the Nordic art, I thought I'd start with telling you about my three-week trip to Mexico in 2007. But don't worry, it, it will uh, all make sense in the end, or I hope so. Uh, what I wanted to get at is the work of three wonderful artists here in Iceland, but it might take me a little bit of time to get there, so please bear with me. But at least let's uh, start with uh, looking at some art. And my colleague, the curator uh, Montserrat Alvores, had organized a solo exhibition of the Swedish artist, artist Elin Wikström at the Sala de Arte Publica Sikiros, uh, including four of her earlier pieces and one new work. Given the fact that Wikström's practice is a performative and relational or activated situations in her own terms, the project involved reenactments or remakes of the older work while Wikström herself was busy performing in the new work every day in the gallery. One of the older works was uh, thanks to Stean, Elisabeth Sör and Morten Bennett, first manifested in Copenhagen in 1996 when together with her friend Wikström set out to spend every night during the exhibition period in a new home with people she had never met before. The exhibition lasted a whole month. The idea was that the first host would find a place for her to stay the next night, that the second host would find a place for her to stay the third night, etc. Uh, this was a chain of spontaneous encounters that uh, took place, or at least that was the idea, uh, most of the time. Uh, in fact, uh, the chain didn't work, and the artist and her friend spent the night in the gallery floor on the mattress. But um, that's not for here. In 2006, Montserrat Alvarez included this work by Wikström, thanks to Stan, Elizabeth, etc., in a group exhibition upstate New York at the time when I was living there together with my wife. Little did we know when we were asked to host this Swedish artist and her friend because of some performance or exhibition or whatever. And of course, we welcomed our Nordic friends in our home. Wikström and her friend were delightful guests. They even brought us flowers, as you can see. And uh, we had dinner, we, had very, uh, we were of course very curious about the uh, whole work and we had a good discussion. Then we made their beds on the, on the floor, in the living room, and the day after we took them sightseeing on the poet's walk. We also arranged for them to sleep over uh, with some other friends uh, the following night. That day there was a fresh bouquet of flowers in the exhibition space in the gallery and a text on the wall. So you see maybe by now how the work uh, functions. Every day, Wikström took the flowers when the museum closed and brought them to the next host, changing also the text on the wall or updating it. That was the only thing the visitors to the museum would see or experience. The rest was exclusively the experience of the artist, her friend who was traveling with her, and their hosts. A year later, in 2007, my wife and I found ourselves on the other side of the table, having accepted to take the place of Wikström and her friend in the re-enactment or reactivation of the work in Mexico City. The artist was busy performing in her new durational piece, and we took the part of the art globe trotters. This was a totally new experience for us, having never been in Mexico, and uh, we had stopped pretending being artists long time ago, so it was fun to play that role again. Then again, one of the many issues that came up was the question of what was our role? Weren't we just tourists? Were we actors, sidekicks, or what? For Wikström, this was also new, to have someone else do the work for her. So all in all, a very exciting enterprise. But uh, to cut a long story short, what happened were numerous interesting encounters with wonderful people who let us into their homes, sometimes even into their beds, uh, while sleeping on the floors themselves. Uh, Wikström was actually in the chain as one of the hosts, so the tables did really turn. And with our hosts, we had engaging conversation about the piece and, uh, uh, that we were part of, and they, they as well. And a lot of questions were raised that were interesting and challenging. Sometimes no questions were asked at all, as we didn't speak any Spanish, and our hosts know English. We, of course, also had many conversations with the artist about the piece and really got into the whole thing, enjoying it tremendously, with food poisoning, exhaustion, and arguments, the whole package. Um, the Mexico experience had stayed with me and has stayed with me until today. And I often tell stories about the people I met, the things we saw and the places we experienced during our stay there. 
come to realize that the stories I tell are in fact a significant part of Ickstrom's work. Part of her practice uh, is never to show documents of her work. Uh, she didn't interrogate us or ask us to take pictures or write a blog or, or anything of the kind, hold lectures. I'm doing this uh, here on my own terms. I haven't called her up actually. It was enough to keep the flow going and enjoy it while it lasted. Uh, the work can be reactivated at a later stage, but never exhibited as uh, archival information. Here again is the manifestation of the work in the exhibition space. Uh, for publication purposes, uh, Wikström actually um, or usually has a single picture, usually a quite random picture, and she writes a short text describing the activated situation, that's all. And at the time, there were of course quite a, a group of uh, people involved in the reactivation of the piece, and they became a part of the work, but uh, when I'm telling you this story now, the work pro proves to have a sort of an afterlife. Uh, perhaps even on the side of the hosts, who knows? So thanks to Pablo, Mariana, Jonathan, Tobias, Yudzil, etc. in 2007. Well, ever since, whenever I think of performance art, I remember the questions that were discussed during our stay in Mexico, and I think they are totally relevant in the work that being, has been produced around us today. Uh, what is performance? Who is performing? Where is the audience? Or what's the public? What's the private? Uh, what is left behind? Who cares? How does this practice just challenge uh, curatorial practice? So, let's begin here in Iceland. But um, I don't want to go into the contemporary art scene just yet. Let's begin a few years back. Actually, let's, let's begin a uh, uh, hundred years ago or something like that. Um, having taken part in Wikström's work, I am reminded of the work by uh, artist Birger Andersson, born 1955 and deceased 2007. He created it around the year 1990. He called the project Different People, a series of uh, enlarged found photographs and the adjacent bookwork, uh, bookwork entitled Nearness, now like published in 1991. Andresson researched old printed matter and folk tales, fishing stories and, uh, and images of different people, vagrants of all descriptions who found a shelter over their heads by traveling from farm to farm, often providing some quirky entertainments or showing a special skill in return. In other words, Andersson, Andersson's was uh, an artist's humble attempt, and I'm quoting here directly, an artist's humble attempt merely to shed vague light on the colorful soil and unique environment from which Icelandic culture sprouted forth. End of quotation. The first character who Andersson uh, studied was Dream Joe in the late 1980s. Joe traveled from one farm to the next in the 19th century, offering interpretation of dreams in exchange for shelter and food. Uh, he would even dream something himself that might cast light on, on something uh, that was going on at the farm. Uh, maybe maybe a, a lost jewel or, or the matters of love. Then there was Gwendor Dullari, who once had the chance to hear a visitor from the Alps yodel for the locals. And he sat down to master the art in his very own way and used his special dull as an entertainment in turn to place, for a place to stay. The people are long gone. But the stories remain, and we can still wonder about their art. Grounding his work firmly on local heritage, research into the rich tradition of storytelling was intrinsic to Andresson's practice. The Icelandic language was a paramount medium for him. The relationship between vision and language and their role in creation of value and memory. Andresson was particularly interested in material that demonstrated an attempt to define the identity of Iceland and Icelanders. In, in his uh, investigation, he was equally f focused on tracing elements that were hidden between the lines of historic texts or behind old oh. photographs. His search uh, included enlarging these old photographs, rasterizing, redrawing, or repainting them. He attempted to discover the overlooked and the ignored that might come closer to something genuine, a bona fide uh, identity, if you will. His remarkable project on vagrants and outsiders suggested the question of what you might learn about them, or what you might learn about the whole from its deviations. At the same time, he was acknowledging the fact that uh, he, was, uh, he was acknowledging what we might call the first generation of performance artists that uh, we have any knowledge of. He reproduced, reproduced these images, but more importantly, he collected the stories behind them, behind every person. In his book, there are sometimes no images and just the name of the vagrant, Runki the preacher, Thorleifur the intellect, Ole the knitter, Helgi the storyteller, and so forth. The art or particular talent still remains in anecdotes and vague memory that Andresson was clever enough to harness in his own work. Now I'm not going to make uh, any attempt to, to make equal the dire need and poverty of those unfortunate homeless, homeless people a century ago, 
and, uh, and the activated situation of a privileged Nordic artist and curators in Mexico three years ago. <coughs> well, after a, a tequila or two, I can't say I wasn't tempted to yodel a little bit for my host, but uh, more often they would pick up a guitar and a sombrero and, and play something for us. Still, it is interesting to consider the two uh, projects or works I've mentioned. Uh, in the matter of relationship to artist and viewer, what is art, what is real life? When does art happen? And importantly, what remains after it's gone? Or how is it preserved? So, now we get closer in time. And here we have uh, in Iceland a few artists that I'd like to talk about who also choose private exper experience for their performative practice. And uh, in a certain way, they also rely on the preservation or should I say extension of their work within the tradition of word of mouth. Much as the practice that I've been talking about, they have uh, their performance, taken their performance to a level of close intimacy with the viewer, but uh, they managed to set the stage for um, the extens existence of their work on another level via stories or, or hearsay. By, by inviting them to join them, uh, meet them or interact with them, the artists bring performance uh, in a certain way back to its very roots, where the audience would become part of the work in a new and exciting way, where the happening in the moment is favored over the production of objects, and nothing remains afterwards uh, except the story. Now, browsing through Art Forum a couple of years ago, uh, you might have come across uh, this advertis ad advertisement from uh, the performance hall girl. The Icelandic artist Ástif Siv Gunnarsdóttir has repeatedly, over uh, specific amounts of time, uh, been Alert by her computer uh, every Sunday in case someone anticipating a web performance rings her up on Skype. Each uh, performance or each person gets a special treatment, a spontaneous dreamlike fantasy that lasts a few minutes, invoking questions of identity of the performer who transcends into a diversity of mythical roles via current image technology. They are a merger of uh, female stereotypes, for example, the gypsy fortune teller and the lady of the night who accepts appointments by call. Austis has a variety of oddments, uh, clothes at hand, wigs and glimmer and uh, Christmas decorations, feathers, mirrors and lights. Uh, should someone call, she delivers an abstract display or a visual poem, as she calls it, reciting uh, improvised phrases or uh, demonstrating all sorts of gimmicks. It's uh, fascinating to associate the ridiculously flivorous stunts that she actually employs with the baffling outcome on the other end of the line, on the viewers. And the viewer will only get a partial glimpse of what's going on, distorted colors and uh, blurred shimmers and vague messages. And behind the razzmatazz, there is a serious investigation into the relationship between artists and viewer. As an art experience, the Skype performers take place in a unique setup and far from the traditional art space. The viewer is one-on-one -on -one with the artist, who not only performs for him or her alone, but uh, sees them in the way as they see her on her side. This is an intimate situation, evoking the notion of various traits of the sex industry, such as the peep show. And Austi certainly does not attempt to conceal the reference by literally naming her performance uh, or the happening, the per performance art girl, uh, performance call girl. However, here's, uh, hers is less an attempt to, to take on the cliched metaphor of art and prostitution, as it is a pun aimed at uh, highlighting the unorthodox art site, which is the, the net, on the web. By uh, editing out and ignoring various layers between artist and viewers, such as the gallery space or the art object and the, and the textual information, she strips the art experience down to a level of personal, instant and non-collectible gestures. She still very much relies on familiar, familiar art forms, namely video and performance, both of which uh, defy the art institution and have sub subsequently, to a larger or greater extent, been incorporated by it. <coughs> and Wagner brings up uh, many of these in issues that are embedded in Austi's work in her text, performance, video, and uh, the rhetoric of presence from 2000. She stresses that the history of performance and video art is marked by an intense posture towards the viewer focusing on the abuses that the body and the senses suffer via these contemporary mediations, she claims uh, that the viewer no, now needs some restructuring. They must be made to see anew, to see actively, to see critically, to see suspiciously, to see themselves doubled, maybe duped by the artist who is the object of their gaze. End of quotation. Austis dupes and doubles her viewer in the sense that her medium is like a mirror 
she and the viewer are both looking at the computer screen with a built-in camera. They gaze at her and she gazes back at them. The screen becomes a mystical tool where the body and the senses get distorted. In Iceland, where there is a tradition of, uh, for, for the creation of new local words for new inventions, the word for computer is actually tölva, which is a portmanteau word deriving from tölur, or numbers, and völva, for the seeing stone. So the computer becomes a crystal ball that Austis and the viewer scry simultaneously. She mischievously treats technology as a psychic phenomenon and embeds her artist viewer question within the relationship of the, of the psyche and the machine. Posing as clairvoyant or a witch in her Skype performances, she flirts with the notion that the persistent enchantment with technology finds its roots in religious or transcendental imagination. Consider Austi's fantastic titles of previous projects, Netscape Oracles, Techno Witch, The Red Siren, Future Crash, Tribal TV, Future Crash TV, and TV Fortune Teller. She couldn't be more explicit about the intrinsic effect of communications media. As she trifles with transhumanism, where technology has turned to myth, she is more interested in the empirical level of consciousness, the elusive and the nebulous, rather than the rational. Again, what she's saying is of less, less uh, significance than uh, by what means she does it and how it is received. This certainly does not mean that her work would be of equivocal, equivocal uh, importance, no matter what she did, just as, as long as it was on, on, on the Skype. But Austria's agenda is playfully disguised in the camp terminology of the porn industry and the anticipation of a technophile utopia. Regardless of, her, um, regardless of the provocative implications underlying her work, her aesthetic is personal and complex, inspired by various sources in visual culture. She's generous enough to offer one client after the other a beautiful and unique moment every Sunday, a genuine afternoon delight, if you want. As, the, um, as they engage in the conduct, mesmerized, their senses are challenged and the relationship of art and audience, audience put to the test. Uh, asking her specifically about this work, Austis also emphasizes how she uses it as an active studio, an ongoing studio practice, where she allows herself to try out something new, to make mistakes and, and progress in uh, her practice. Role play and the question of fictional identity took a radical turn in the hands of the artist Körver Thorotsen. Given a regular Icelandic name as a, any other child, he decided to take up a new one in uh, 2006 and uh, he would no longer answer to the name which must not be mentioned. <laughs> but as Curver, the brand name of an international plastic manufacturer that makes garbage cans and, and uh, lunchboxes. Curver Thorotsen has been very consequent in his performative actions over the last few years. Recently, however, he's broken it up and started challenging his established uh, methods. Every now and then, you would see a poster downtown or advertisement in the papers of one of Curver's real life performances, as he calls them himself. There was the famous hamburger tour, where we announced a certain where uh, he, he announced a certain time and a place in different burger joints in Reykjavik over the run of a few days. People were invited to come to see him eat a hamburger. And some people did, while some sometimes no one came. The very few who actually experienced the performance either stood passively at a distance and once they actually clapped when Curver had, had finished his meal. Or they would sit down with him and order a burger themselves. One of them stated, so if I get it right, I'm eating a hamburger, but you're making art. <laughs> Curver was playing with the format of rock and roll groups who would go on a tour announcing the dates and venues. In, in his case, however, it was the hamburger tour. And it attracted around 15, 20 people over the whole tour. That doesn't change the fact that work, uh, the work became quite known and still people remember it as part of Curver's oeuvre, even though there exists little or no documentation. A part of Curver's practice has always been this relationship with the media. So whenever he takes on a project, he carefully plans it with the functions of the media in mind. As a result, the only significant documentation of his real life performances exists in newspaper clippings and TV news. As a rule, the underlying news value of covering his events would always be the question, but is it art? In 2005, Curver announced that uh, he was uh, renovating his apartment over the period of a couple of weeks, and that people could access, uh, access a web camera 24 seven to follow up on the work. The apartment, that was the title of the work, landed on my desktop and I remember the strange intimacy that I developed with a little window on my computer screen. There he was, painting the kitchen cabinets or rearranging his record collection. It was quite the Truman Show experience. 
but I found myself enjoying the most boring things like someone cleaning their house. And I remember the party which he held when he finished. The exclusive and private experience that somehow enters the uh, collective memory has always been the essence of Kerber's performant, uh, performance art. So I find it really interesting to consider his most recent work, where he turns things around completely. In an exhibition venue in New York, uh, Kerber built a corner very similar to his very own living room, <coughs> with an easy chair, a TV, and a plant. Over the period of the exhibition, he sat in the chair in his dressing gown and watched television. <laughs> and another example, aiming to inverse the private situation in his real life performances. Kerber installed a bathroom situation in a public gallery and continuously went through the loop of taking a shower and shaving in front of the group of exhibit, exhibit goers uh, that passed by. A little story from behind the scenes make the work, makes the work some to, somewhat uh, of a, of a self-torture. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, when the installation was, was ready, the exhibition opened, there was no hot water in the pipes. <laughs> but he he, he performed. So it's interesting to see what comes out of the um, reverse situation that Kerber is, is experimenting with, but he still continues to create his um, off-the-track performances, like uh, his proje project from last summer, Sliceland, where he put an ad in the papers for Sliceland, the westest pizza in Europe. <laughs> Situated in the Bjarktanger Lighthouse on the edge of the West Fjords, it takes six or seven hours to drive from Reykjavik to reach this westmost point of Europe. If you happen to take the trip, or if you were just a tourist who chance, uh, by chance uh, were in the vicinity, you would find Kerber in the lighthouse, his temporary in his uh, temporary pizza parlor, where he prepared and served pizza with topping from the nearby Lautraberg bird cliffs. There are not many I know of who actually experienced the work in person, or if they did, if they had a slice of the puffin pizza. But as uh, with Kerber's older real life performances, this work is known through stories and anecdotes. Kerber's practice very much comes out of the local situation here in Iceland with a tradition of seamless uh, crossover, the limited size of the community and the uh, level of art discourse. Kerber has always been an active musician, uh, currently together with our representative of culture and tourism within the city of Reykjavik, Einar Örd, from the Best Party. He is in the band Ghost Digital. So borrowing from uh, form and structure from the realm of, of music scene, like uh, I was talking about earlier, the, the announcement of the Hamburger tour, it, quite, it comes quite naturally into the practice of Kerber. The smallness of the art scene in Iceland means that easily you can access the, or, or at least attract uh, more or less all the players within the field, who if, uh, if they didn't experience the work themselves, will hear about it from their friends. Then, to his interest, he plays the general disinterestedness of the media by giving them exactly what they want, a reason to roll their eyes and say, so is it art. He, uh, his reply uh, is quite honest and uh, may have opened the eyes to some skeptics. Art can incorporate everything, but nothing can, but not everything can incorporate, incorporate art. Art can incorporate everything, but not everything can incorporate art. So Kerber is now living in New York, where he was just accepted into the residency program of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Of course, one of his major challenges is the fact that he cannot, in the same extent, carry on his practice as he did here in Iceland. So I'm very curious about the way things will develop over there. He seems to be revising the avant-garde, uh, or, or turning it around, this, uh, this avant-garde practice of his, instead of extending it far out, further away from the institution, he brings his everyday life into the art space. As I was telling you about the shower performance and the TV performance, are part of Kerber's uh, working out of this uh, challenge. Obviously, an important factor is the lost of, uh, uh, an important fa factor is lost in the process, um, the element that, uh, that I'm talking about here, which is the notion of a limited private experience with the artwork, where you become a vital part of it, or as a witness to that it happened at all. So the third and final player who I want to bring into the equation of private performers is the youngest of the three, Paul Haukur Björnsson. Hmm. Not so long ago, he sent a personal email to me and my wife, inviting us to see a work of his called Relentless Repetition and a Cowboy. So more or less he is inviting us, if we, if we have the time, to to go and uh, do a, experience a work with him for 45 minutes. Da -da -da -da. He'll contact me and we'll set up a date. So uh, we accepted and negotiated the time and the place for the pickup by the big church. And there accepting us was, uh, was a, a little car waiting for us. We got into the back and in the front there were two people sitting, the driver and 
and uh, someone next to him. They were both with masks, so we didn't really see who it was. And uh, very briefly, they asked us to put on goggles, which limited our sight. We couldn't see anything with, uh, with these weird things on. And the car started driving, and the volume was turned up in the, in the stereo, and the ambient music was playing. I immediately fell asleep. Fifteen minutes later, the car stopped. Googles were taken off, and I had no idea where I was, which is quite difficult when you're in Reykjavik. I mean, you know Reykjavik as a, as a person living here. But I, I didn't realize where I was. Some construction site, and I was led together with my wife into this uh, apartment that was being built. And uh, there, we entered a weird situation. Um, we were sat down by a table, and um, there was a lot to take in, objects, sculptures, sketches, what seemed to be sketches of the whole enterprise from, uh, from the beginning to the end. There was a DJ playing some more noise, ambience music. Um, the girl who was in the car, she started bringing us some fruit pudding. Uh, we could see that the artist, Pautl, he was stuck in a machine with his face and, and hidden in some sort of a jar. And In a video you would see the face and it was covered with water. He was in the water trying to breathe. Uh, his genitals were in a tube connected to the sculpture. Uh, the girl started recording us with a video camera while we were watching the, the whole thing and, and projected our image into the work itself. So we saw ourselves watching. So after a while she, she just uh, told us to get into the car again, put on the goggles, and the car would uh, drive us back to the church. And there was a country song playing in, uh, in the stereo with some lyrics about trying to cope with the institution, which is very vague and, and unclear. So this is the place that uh, we were taken to, and the part of the installation in this deserted or not yet ready apartment. DJ, weird sculpture, mm -hmm. the uh, sketches, and the girl hovering over us in the stairs. Hot. the artist himself, and uh, having seen a few of his performances, even though you didn't see his face, you would recognize him because he's usually naked in his performances. Yeah. <laughs> You're familiar with the, with the setup? And there she is recording us, this weird alien figure. So the work, Relentless Repetition and the Cowboy, came out of another piece that Pothoek had created for the Sequences Art Festival, actually. Inviting people for a short drive through the city while they had the chance to watch a video on the laptop, uh, on, their, on their laps. The video showed footage from the car-free city of Venice, and the whole experience lasted around 15 minutes. His new work, in all its complexities, managed to disturb the notion or, or the duration of time completely. But uh, to be precise, it took a total of 45 minutes, with uh, 15 minutes driving, 7 minutes in the location, and 15 minutes back, and plus minus. Also, it really confused one's senses for place. So, all in all, a rare experience in the arts, where you're used to take probably art in on your own terms. There you were, at the mercy of the artist, and I remember that uh, perhaps this fruit pudding that they were giving us, I was thinking, perhaps it's poisoned. It sort of tells us, uh, or, you know, tells a lot about the unease of the situation. But uh, no more than 20 people accepted Pothlöcker's invitation to the performance, and he describes how upset they were if they missed it, when others started telling stories about it and the exhibition period that had expired. The artist uh, counted on uh, this chain of events, actually, and was very precise in not doing the work on demand, but only by his invitation at a given time. By manipulating the situation as an artist, he demanded some effort or determination on behalf of the viewer and uh, changed the power situation between the two. The viewer comes to terms with losing control and allows the piece to take him wherever it might go, even food poisoning. He also took advantage of the fact that the word would spread around and uh, at a given point people would take initiative and ask if they could come too. He incorporated that possibility just slightly but uh, quit at a critical moment. So the notion of exclusion is important here. But uh, it's not so much the exclusion in and of itself that's the criti critical issue at stake. I find it's rather the precise activation of the bus, that uh, the part of the work where the artist doesn't have complete control, where the work takes uh, a life of, of its own in the stories being told, like the, one, like the ones I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you now. Paul Hoeker explains how he came to 
start uh, experimenting with this kind of work. He had been uh, performing and, uh, and doing performance work and was often asked how it felt to be doing it. This inspired him to invite the viewers to change places with him, to be within the situation with him, or leave them alone in the situation that he had constructed for himself as a performer. This gave him the idea to try and consider his practice in a way of performing with the viewer, not for him. He, was furthermore studied, uh, he had uh, furthermore studied the experimental happenings of the 60s, very much inspired by that, and realized that the jolting element intrinsic to the early performance work is something that has fallen out of the equation, as you have gotten used to it over the decades. He is looking for what Alan Capro described as no separation between audience and play, researching the possibilities of the fundamental elements of the performance or happenings that appear to go nowhere and do not make any particular point. They have no structure and they're gone forever after a single performance or only a few. To borrow Capro's words. Pottleuker also looks towards the work by the situationists, in particular their walks through the city. And uh, then he, described, uh, in his, uh, he describes also his interest in medieval sculpture that was created meticulously uh, hidden away in studios and then hidden within the walls of buildings or up on the rooftops of churches out of the sight of, of people and uh, intended only for the view of God. Performance art has a rich history and for decades it's been a valid medium in contemporary art, of course, as we know. What uh, might have begun as uh, the most challenging of any art in the air at present, like Capra put it, uh, is now just as common as any other medium. It's been uh, highly theorized and art historicized and intellect, uh, institutionalized. As viewers, there's little difference in how we observe performance or video or any other time-based medium. I find the ongoing search within the performance uh, practice to break up this routine re relationship between the audience and the art quite interesting, and, uh, trying to trace it back to the origins. Performance ha has a rich history back into the 70s, and here in Iceland, uh, if we include uh, Birgir Andrésson's ob observations, we would go back way further. Today, performance is, is uh, celebrated here in Iceland every, every year in the International Time-Based Art Festival sequences. Furthermore, the Living Art Museum has for the last few years been focusing on the institution's 30-year-long history, documenting, archiving, and trying to make sense of what's been going on there for decades. This resulted, among other things, in a very interesting book that just came out. Uh, one of the branches of this activity is the ongoing registration of performance art in Iceland, from the beginning to the present. And uh, the enterprise has proven fruitful with photographs and videos coming together in one archive from the 70s to the present. But obviously, they face the same dilemma of, uh, of uh, what to collect and how. Furthermore, as Gunnhildur Haugsdóttir, one of the people involved in this uh, preservation, uh, put it, what does it mean to objectify the performance time-based magic? Addressing these and other questions, the Living Art Museum is experimenting with ways to also gather stories and anecdotes from artists and onlookers and viewers and witnesses and find ways to make this information accessible. I find it interesting in the work of uh, the above-mentioned artists to what extent they create their work precisely to have an afterlife in the realm of the collectible anecdotes. Uh, my participation in Elin Wikström's uh, activated situation brought up the same questions now being asked in the Living Art Museum. I took part in a, a performative work as a substitute for the real artist. Obviously, the work would have been quite different had it been performed by the artist herself, but she found a way for it to come alive again as a recreation or reactivation. As for Birgit Andersson, not only do I consider his work interesting in the context of performance art, uh, as I already descri described, but uh, talking, about his talking about contemporary arts in Iceland, uh, here is an artist who I'd say is by far the most significant influence on younger generations of artists. He was a popular teacher and inspiring artist, and his life work is currently being analyzed and registered in the catalogue Resonne and uh, further publica publications. Not to mention, there are countless stories of him that will continue to circle around and as time goes by, the boundary between his art and life might blur, if not evaporate completely. I hope that the examples that I've uh, taken make sense in their diversity. The sheer uh, similarities that I find among, among other artists as well here in Iceland, I could mention uh, other artists, such as Ragnar Kjartansson or Icelandic Love Corporation and Ingeborg Magnadóttir, Huyen Thor Arason or, or Steinun Gunnlaugsdóttir, Haraldur Jónsson, there are many, many more who are, who are experimenting with this, what we can call performance in private. But I would also like to mention an example from the realms of theater. The actress Margaret Wilhelmsdottir has been expanding the traditional world of theater in her uh, productions by including or introducing, for example, a theatrical performance for a single viewer at a time. 
Knee Kit or Bundle was a performance uh, created last year and uh, was, took place in a warehouse down by the harbor where a single person would undertake a journey of a sort through the building, meeting characters that would share intimate stories of love and joy and regret. I would say that there is a systematic critique on the institution involved in this practice, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that that's, that's the whole issue here. As the artists I'm talking about, they all accept, exhibit their works uh, within museums and galleries, as well as sometimes to try to combine the notion of private experience within the framework of the institution. Pat Hauker just recently exhibited an elab elaborate work in the Gerdasat Museum, where he performed once a week. Carver is bringing his personal life into the institution, and Austis may pop up in a public event such as an art opening, where she will do a kind of a fortune telling or aura reading for the in individual members of the audience. Perhaps what is at stake uh, is that uh, these artists consider the institution not only as the, in the museum or in the building around it, and buildings around art, but the art community as a whole, with artists and us viewers included. Here in Iceland, this is particularly easy as the people who bother, bother about art at all, they are, they are more, more, no more than a couple of hundred. So this group is part of the institution as, uh, and as such, the artists make use of it for their realization and preservation of their work. And I thank you very much for your good attention.